So good morning, everyone. My name is Raresh Pamphil. Um, I lead a project called Impact Agora, and we're hosting this uh, webinar today for our broader community of, of members and, um, and uh, stakeholders in the Impact ecosystem. Um, we are an industry initiative launched in April, which, um, which enables deal sharing uh, collaboration around investments with Impact. And uh, we have now over 60 members, which include accelerators, uh, investor networks, funds, advisors, and also wealth managers, foundations, uh, family offices, and corporates. And uh, yeah, we operate a, a marketplace for, for deals and funds, which I'll tell you more uh, about at the end and, and how you can join. Um, and we operate that thanks in part to sponsorship uh, from Barclays. Um, the panel we have here today is a focus around corporate venturing uh, in the context of, of impact. And you'll see there are many different models to that. Um, and we have, um, we, we have uh, four great speakers who, who will introduce themselves. And our moderator, James Ferrier from, from Barclays. James leads what is called the Sustainable Impact Capital Initiative, which was launched earlier this year to fund uh, innovative, uh, emerging, uh, high-growth businesses with, with environmental impact. It's a $175 million commitment that is being managed out of the principal investments team in, in Barclays Group, and they've already started to make some investments, which James can tell you about. So without further ado, I'll hand over to James, uh, who will introduce himself and, and the other panelists. Thanks. Thank you very much and uh, good morning. Yeah, my, my name is uh, James Ferrier. I, I work in a uh, principal investments team at, at Barclays and our team is uh, mandated to originate and, and manage private equity positions on behalf of the firm. Um, traditionally, we've been a strategic investor investing in sort of fintech companies looking to innovate and, and disrupt financial services. However, we've recently expanded our mandate, launching the Sustainable Impact Capital Initiative to foster innovation in sustainability. And we'll, we'll touch on that in a bit more detail later. Um, over the next 30 minutes or so, uh, we're going to be talking uh, with our panelists on the topic of how corporates are investing in, in impact. Um, activity in this sector is, is trending upwards, but the approach taken by corporates does indeed vary, uh, which we'll hear about today. Um, the Impact Agora Network has, has brought together an extremely diverse audience today, ranging from uh, companies who are interested in launching or expanding what they do in the, in the impact and uh, corporate venturing space, to entrepreneurs who are planning their next funding round and assessing whether corporate venture capital is, is the right fit to them, or to those who have a, an active role or, or a gen, general interest in the impact investing community. Uh, so we can expect some you know, fantastic Q&A from the audience uh, to, to test our panelists at the end. Uh, but let me, let me introduce this uh, exciting panel with uh, experts from, from across the spectrum. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Katie Heisen. Uh, Katie leads on thought leadership at Business Fights Poverty, uh, Prov Pov Poverty, uh, which is a collaboration network fo focused on social impact. Uh, BFP works closely with corporates to define and amplify their impact strategies. Uh, we, secondly, we have Ashish Kumar. Ashish joins us from the Shell Foundation, where he's responsible for leading, managing early stage venture funding activities across the emerging market impact portfolio. Uh, he has a focus on climate finance, clean tech, circular economy, agriculture, and mobility. And thirdly, we have Jamie Rolls. Jamie is head of investment at Sky Ocean Ventures, uh, leading the fund's investment processes and portfolio management. Uh, he has experience across the early stage investment lifecycle at VC funds, both in the UK and the US, and has helped to build strategies around several new fund launches. So um, let's start at a, 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 a macro, macro level and, and start with you, Katie. Um, you work with a, a large number of, of corporates. Perhaps if you could sort of kick us off with um, what, you, what you do at uh, Business Fights Poverty. Thank you, James. Um, okay, first of all, for everybody listening, um, I, I think there's a q and I'm not sure the q and is really appropriate for this, but I'd love to know where you guys are all sitting. So are you sitting in a 
big company who's looking to do venture capital tools type activities have you already got them are you an entrepreneur are you sitting within a different system or a different sector etc it would really just help make sure that we kind of get to the point um james also threatened that he was going to call me the wrong name all the way through but actually apparently can't say poverty so um if we can also <laughs> <laughs> watching out what i'm going to be called today i think that was going to be a good one so yeah i'm katie i'm the director of thought leadership for business rights poverty um as james said we are a network that was set up actually 15 years ago by um married couple who also partners in life and business, Zahid and Yvette, Taurus Raman, um, really originally as a sort of peer-to-peer -peer support network for professionals who work trying to help business, particularly big business, try to do more social good. Um, we are about connecting, about um, purposeful collaboration, about sort of really working together to try and solve big, hairy problems quite frankly um, and we try and do that in a kind of quite tight time-bound way sort of to nudge the system along um, and we are lucky and I'm fortunate enough to get therefore a bit of a window into a number of big multinational companies so we have a, we keep the number quite small purposefully um, about 30 um, main companies who are kind of at our core um, ranging from GSK and um, Anglo-American to Unilever to Nestle, MasterCard. And in those names, you'll know maybe that a number of them have their own sort of venture capital impact type funds in some way, shape or form. So I, that's where I can sort of talk about this sort of macro level today. But also um, my background is full disclosure. I also am part, was one of uh, the Barclays clan once upon a time. And before that worked for O2, always doing sort of impact type work. But right back a sort of decade ago was watching some of these emerging themes coming through as businesses were trying to figure out how to um, harness some of the innovation. So James has asked me to talk at the macro level. Um, so first of all, why might corporate think about getting into this space? Now, for some of you who've already got your business case, fantastic. No worries. For those who really haven't sort of thought about this yet, for some companies, it's very much around sort of the evolution of their own sort of traditional, perhaps that's an unfair word, but philanthropic or community investment type program. So it's much more around how do you get more strategic with your investments? Is there a way to make sure there's a kind of return on investment um, rather than just quite frankly, pushing that funding out there, hoping that it's going to do some good and it might rub off on you at some point. Um, quite therefore, um, the expectation from stakeholders is also to, 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 to drill this impact down into core business, to, to be more impactful, to be more sustainable in that impact in a sort of longevity sense of the word. Um, the EPPA, who've done quite a lot of research on this, will talk quite a lot about um, a convergence. So they'll talk about a convergence of corporate innovation work for core business investment, but also the different strands of the traditional CSR type impact community, sustainability, etc. Um, and then for others, it might be about fast tracking your impact work. It might be about saying, actually, there's a limited amount of work I can do within my company. It might be about, actually, how can I almost accelerate some of the um, impacts or the social um, companies that might then be potentially useful to my own business strategy going forward. So it might be as much about let's accelerate that company over there because if they come in-house too quickly, we, we, we will slow them down. And then at the right time, we could potentially even bring them in. So um, there's a kind of hybrid model. And that then takes on my, my um, second part of this answer to, to James's question, which is, what do corporate social impact venture programs actually look like? Now, if you ask this question, even probably about two or three years ago, the, the, the answer would be a little bit different. I think what's what we're seeing now are two sliding scales of um, emerging really. So one is how close or far away to the business are these uh, corporate social um, venturing activities? So, what I mean by this, and, and I'll give you some examples in a bit, is that some of the um, programs are traditionally are sitting out in, in within foundations, which is brilliant because they are ring fenced, they are autonomous, they can get on and do stuff. But actually, through um, some of the rules and regulations that, that bind um, foundations, they aren't allowed to show benefit back to the business. So just be aware that that is um, an opportunity and potentially a challenge. Um, to uh, setting up and also to being participating in one of these programs. 
Um, but likewise, if you are um, sitting at the sort of other end of the scale, which is that they are really, really deeply embedded within a core business. So they're, um, the business is much sort of investing in you completely as the, as the corporate sort of venture impact uh, business. Um, they will lean into you and, and the sort of expectation and maybe the patients might be a little bit different in terms of expectation on return on that investment. Um, so I think there's uh, that sort of sliding scale. And then the second part of the sliding scale is how much investment. So both in terms of capital and also um, additional support. And again, that's a real sliding scale. It could be, you know, we're only looking at really scalable or already ready to scale and, and, and really make impact type of organizations right through to seed funding and again they're, they're sitting on that sliding scale um, and, and really both consolidating as I mentioned earlier on but also kind of expanding. So some examples and some sort of terms that you might hear about I mentioned foundations already and um, there's also the sort of strategic investment um, activity that you might hear you might hear about businesses really talk about their VC funds, um, so venture capital. You also might see um, companies partnering with perhaps other parts of other sectors. So, for example, they might be partnering with the public sector, so sort of government backed or hybrid uh, partnered programs. You might hear about accelerators. Um, and what we're also seeing is that leading companies have a number of these. They don't just have one. So you think of Danon, they now have, I think, four different um uh impact venture programs in different parts of their business doing different things focused on different pieces so think about the framework within which you want to act in or where there's a niche quite frankly because you need an opportunity to step into because lots of other companies are already doing this i mean we're even seeing charities stepping into this space i think care us have set up their own uh, social impact venture um portfolio and program so it is expanding it's consolidating in terms of there's the sort of blending of, of, um, of lines, um, but loads of opportunity if you really kind of do your homework as to where the, where the, the gap in the market is for you and your company um, to keep it really strategic. Now, um, if you are thinking about launching your corporate impact venture programme, what are the kind of key aspects? This is, so we've done quite a lot of work within Business Voice Poverty, looking at what really makes um, partnerships work, what really makes venture, pro venture capital pro type programs really work, also what makes innovation work. And so these are some of the things that we're seeing. And we've also honed this recently during, because of the global pandemic, to really look about what has made the big innovation partnership type activities take off and work in a ridiculously short time scale that, that has happened. So for example, some of the vaccine um, development activity has resulted in huge partnerships that we've just never seen before. And these are sort of four key things that came out of some of that research. One is around focus and leadership. So if your leadership are really focused, committed, and you have got, got that clear steer, really vital. If you don't have it, you might be struggling in terms of the bureaucratic um, hurdles, in terms of strategic alignment, in terms of just how long you can run your programme for, and you, and you do need a bit of longevity. Second one is about patient and patience and return on investment. So in terms of what, what are the real expectations from your business? I've seen a few, um, not to name names at this point, a few um, of these type programs sort of fall because the core business, the very sort of business minded people are expecting their returns quite quickly. And sometimes within impact, it doesn't happen that quickly. Um, and I think the other one that we see is where um, the investment is going into almost the pre-competitive space or they're going into the system type change. So, um, for example, there are some of the investment programs are looking at trying to change the whole system that the business is working in. So, for example, education might be one. So businesses don't necessarily immediately benefit from a better education system, but you can imagine at a system level, if you have better educated workforce um, uh, community, you've potentially got a better um, pool of people to put a workforce from, you've got people who are potentially uh, more employable, can earn more, et cetera, and then can be better con consumers, customers, but actually the immediate return on investment for education for a business over a five, even a 10 year process is a drop in the ocean in terms of trying to change that system. So look and be careful about the patience and the returns on investment and the expectation from your business. 
It leads me into the fourth piece, which is about measurement. So um, finance measurement has got a huge history and it's quite easy to measure. Some would question that, but in comparison to trying to measure some of the social impact in particular, environment and governance is a bit more um, sort of established framework and, and um, uh, recognize expectation and how, how, how do you measure that? Particularly social, it's, it's quite difficult. Everybody's doing it differently. There's really not re one framework uh, yet. Um, and number four would be about communication. And that kind of talks across everything. Communication within your business, communication to the investor and between investor and investee. So my final piece is around in entrepreneurs. If you are sitting here as an entrepreneur, potentially listening to this today, things that you might want to think about and to consider. And this is as much from my personal experience, but I'm also married to one of said entrepreneurs. And this is from, I, I quizzed him last night and these are the things that he said to me. He said, make sure that you are really, really ready for this investment. And, and again, this is something I've seen quite a few times um, from my past, which is those companies will expect things from you. You will, um, there's a time commitment to it often. It's not often just you get the money, but you might also get that kind of corporate lean in. Um, but then there might be massive other benefits. So make sure, are you really, really investment ready? Um, second one, where's the money coming from? As I just mentioned, the foundations might mean that you cannot get too close to the business um, because of the way that they are structured, because of their tax relief, et cetera. And I've seen a number of businesses who get really, um, who've been invested in, really frustrated that they've got this kind of amazing benefit that they could offer to the corporate who are investing in them and they, ca they can't get anywhere near them, they're not allowed to. Um, so it might be that you just want to choose which investment bit, um, fund you apply for or get involved with, but it might be a question just to ask, can I transfer between the different funds at some point in order to be able to um, lean into those potential scalable um, sort of partnering opportunities? Third one is the company in it for the long term. You know, how patient is that capital? Are they really strategically sort of leaning into that? And the final one is um, content books and, um, sorry, contact books and uh, market access. So again, the benefit of if a company is really up for this and into it could really mean that the money is a drop in the ocean. And this was um, something that my other half absolutely lent into. He was like, the money for me is zero sort of, 0.1% of the reason why I get involved. I want I want to get that little black book, black book, the Rolodex open, and I want to get into that um, corporate. So um, there are lots of different uh, opportunities there, but I'll, I'll finish on that one, James. Hopefully that's what gives you a bit of an overview. No, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. So um, let, let's explore what this uh, this means for corporates on a day-to-day um, a -day basis and, and get clarity from the situation on the ground. Um, Ashish, perhaps we could uh, move to you now and, and perhaps you could tell us how, how Shell have approached this. Great. Thank you, James. And great to hear thoughts from Katie. Uh, I'll build on some of the things that you've mentioned. So uh, glad to be in this panel. I'll, I'll start with um, sort of giving a lay of the land how Shell Foundation is set up and how it is sort of, uh, how Shell has generally approached uh, the whole area of like, uh, you know, uh, corporate venturing on one side, but also impact investing on the other. So Shell Foundation is a independent UK registered charity. I just should say for a disclaimer that we are not part of the Shell corporate. We are not a CSR. We were set up as a, uh, you know, independent charity uh, a couple of decades ago in 2010. And uh, we call ourselves uh, our relationship with the uh, corporate side as independent, but linked. And by that, I specifically mean that, you know, our decision making is our, we have a board of trustees where we have some uh, shell corporate uh, representatives, but we have a lot of independent members as well. And uh, we, we do have uh, some sort of uh, uh, both formal and informal linkage with the corporate. But uh, the way we operate is uh, think of us more as like an independent venture philanthropic entity. Uh, we are early stage, uh, you know, impact uh, oriented uh, venture investor, uh, and uh, we have a portfolio of around 40 to 50 enterprises in, uh, you know, in the emerging markets, uh, primarily covering sub-Saharan Africa, India, and partly in Latin in the past. Uh, we, we focus on sectors like uh, energy access, which is like mapped to, if you look at SDGs, uh, SDG 7. Uh, and primarily through clean energy and renewables. And then uh, we also look, off, uh, look at sustainable mobility and uh, 
um, part of that work is uh, in agriculture as well. Uh, our role, what we try to do in our work is to create, uh, uh, you know, we have the thesis around market-based solutions to impact, you know. So we believe in that, uh, you know, any uh, uh, sustainable business models can create large-scale impact, uh, which is kind of building on the, like decades of how developmental work has been. And uh, our, for us, success means like taking a early stage venture, like, you know, a, a social entrepreneur and uh, giving them high risk, uh, you know, uh, grant capital in many times uh, uh, and uh, de-risking their business model as well as technology in some cases to a point where they can attract large scale capital, uh, commercial capital. So for us, success would mean like, you know, we provide a pipeline for Series A, Series B uh, level, you know, venture investors, or in many times we we, we deploy a suite of uh, instruments. Uh, it's like uh, we have done like guarantee mechanisms or we have done like first loss or, you know, taking junior positions in larger funds where it allows for like the other commercial investors or even impact investors to realize both return. Uh, you know, it could be like not as, high return, but uh, it's a sort of uh, in the in the realm of like blended finance, as you may have heard of, like, you know, it's the balance of return and impact. Um, so we play that catalytic role at early stage, which makes, uh, which provides that sort of uh, high quality pipeline or in, in terms of uh, pure investing, like the deal flow uh, uh, for uh, more late stage investors. And besides that, we focus a lot on uh, what we call ecosystem building, as Katie, you were referring to some of the like systems, uh, you know, thinking approach and the need for that in a number of sectors. So we have done a lot of that uh, in uh, in the sectors we care about, that we are passionate about, be it sort of uh, energy access or you know mobility or cooking, also clean cooking. Uh, so there's like industry associations we have, you know, helped create. There's like uh, standards bodies, uh, you know, uh, which. Uh, we have helped set up and we have also, uh, you know, examples of what we call market accelerators, like, you know, entities which help any venture, not just our portfolio, but any venture in the sector to sort of address some of the key market barriers, be it around payment solutions in Nigeria, for example, or be it around like working with the government on uh, more forward looking policy lobbying on renewables in, 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 in Uganda or like Ethiopia. So our approach is in that way, you know, uh, looking at uh, all the uh, pieces and what, uh, you know, could, uh, what could lead to like any solutions to scale. Uh, we are obsessed with scale and we don't want like to be a, uh, have a scattergun approach where we have like, you know, uh, hundreds of in our portfolio or typical like how grant funding used to be in the past. Like, you know, you have a grant application, you apply and, you know, uh, there was limited follow through. Uh, what we try to do is be hands on active venture builder. We support the enterprises in many ways outside our grant, uh, like it be sort of their sort of fundraising challenge, be it sort of marketing operations, and then take them to a stage where, you know, they can attract commercial funding. Uh, so that's more on like, you know, how, uh, what is our portfolio like? And uh, Perhaps, I, James, I can talk a bit about how uh, Shell broadly, you know, has other sort of arms uh, that, you know, are involved in investing or, you know, venture part. Yeah, absolutely. That would be quite interesting, especially around, you know, we've heard about the Shell Ventures and, and those teams. So perhaps if you could just give us very briefly uh, a sub summary of that, of that, that would be great. Yeah. So, yeah, first of all, I, my but, you know, I represent foundation, but I will uh, share what, you know, the corporate has been doing uh, from what I know of. Uh, so Shell, in terms of like uh, venture investing, uh, depending on the stage of, you know, different interventions or businesses, they have a number of programs or initiatives. There's like, you know, uh, uh, looking at very early stage uh, venture funding as well, which is more even like, you know, uh, research level work, uh, you know, that they do, uh, they have different program. Then they have teams of Shell Venture, you know, uh, uh, which is, uh, looks at investing more at like, I believe Series B or C level, you know, uh, and more into uh, anything uh, around uh, sort of, uh, not just like uh, renewables, but broader energy access, even oil and gas. Uh, so they, and then there's another team, uh, another setup, uh, few years ago, uh, it's called Shell New Energies, 
which is primarily looking at you know uh, renewables and you know emerging clean uh, technologies. Uh, they have a mandate, and I think it's public uh, around like one to two billion uh, almost per year uh, to do investing. Uh, and the key difference, I would say, between those entities and us at Shell Foundation is that they are tied to the corporate's uh, you know commercial interests, you know, and uh, they will have to you know benefit corporate commercial in commercial way in the long term. And that's how those strategic investments, um, as some of the examples Kerry was saying, like, you know, it, it's driving innovation for them in that way. However, we at Shell Foundation, we have to, we are like, you know, we have a, like a thick Chinese wall uh, in that way. And we have to ensure that there is no sort of a commercial, you know, interest for the corporate side. And we try to sort of uh, really uh, uh, demarcate that, you know, as, uh, as clearly as possible. Uh, and we take necessary steps towards that in terms of our controls and you know <clears throat> uh, how we operate. Um, it's not just us. I can ex uh, mention a couple of other examples of other corporates who have you know done it. So, for example, uh, uh, Mastercard and Mastercard Foundation are again like you know uh, two very different entities. Mastercard Foundation was set up, I think, in back in 2006, and there uh, they have a pure charitable objective, uh, and they are. I think they run like massive, more programmatic investment rather than venture investment. I may be wrong. Maybe have, they have done some uh, venture investment as well. But uh, there are then uh, again, um, like uh, corporates like AB and Bev, uh, which have an accelerator, venture accelerator called JEDEX Ventures, uh, both funder and accelerator. And they, a lot of the work that let's say the accelerator does is also tied into uh, the broader goals of AB and Web in terms of inclusive supply chains and you know making the kind of let's say the farmers they work with in in emerging markets in in sub-saharan africa uh, they want to make them more uh, you know uh, focus on uh, areas around financial inclusion and in that sense they have done investments uh, into enterprises let's say a blockchain enterprise which enables that uh, uh, you know uh, financial inclusion uh, uh, so there, there are different approaches to how like, you know, a number of other corporates uh, have, you know, have taken uh, in, it, at the intersection of what we call like, you know, corporate venturing and uh, sort of, you know, uh, pure impact uh, lens feed across ESG. And uh, I think our work at Shell Foundation has been uh, primarily focused on building these types of uh, catalytic solutions, which can be scaled uh, in the long term. Yeah. So uh, I'll stop there and I can uh, focus on any specific aspects if that would be useful. No, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, uh, J Jamie, perhaps we could uh, we could move to you now um, with the sort of same question so that we can we can understand how um, Sky have uh, have approached this. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. And um, fascinating points to, to build on, really. But um, so yes, I uh, lead um, Sky Ocean Ventures, which sits within Sky's bigger picture team, which is you know fundamentally it's corporate social responsibility group, um, and there are multiple strands to that. But you know, social, environmental, um, general kind of responsible business elements. Um, so it's kind of there's already a taxonomy there that's a little bit complicated if you're coming at this with a as from an entrepreneurial standpoint. Um, but we are primarily focused on the environmental kind of side of things, um, and Sky as a corporate has historically had multi-year environmental campaigns as a media company, as a news organization. And so for the last four years, um, really, we've been running something called Sky Ocean Rescue, which has been a, uh, a campaign around ocean health. And, you know, one of the big themes obviously has been plastic pollution, which I think has been a, you know, an issue that we, we've all seen and, and heard about a lot over the last few years as a result of kind of media coverage. Um, we, the, the, the campaigns have multi kind of tiered approaches with, with a communication angle and a, and a consumer awareness angle. We are a media company after all. So, so there's a big kind of consumer lens to it. There's a business transformation exercise talking about removing single use plastics from more operations. Um, and, and then I guess my team is the first time that Sky actually has, has gone into um, corporate impact investment. So we have had a strategic venture team, like a lot of other corporates that's invested in, you know, uh, media and, 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 and other kind of digital business models that, that affect Sky's core business. Um, but we are, uh, you know, and historically it's done philanthropy as Katie was talking as well, there's a sort of taxonomy here. Um, and we've done, you know, charitable giving and other kind of uh, consumer led donation programs. 
Um, but this is the first time that money from the balance sheet has gone into early stage technology companies who are um, in their product or service are seeking to affect an environmental outcome. And that outcome is, is plastics and, and ocean uh, leakage. Um, so that's sort of broadly how we fit within the organization. And I guess, you know, we are, um, we think of us like a normal early stage venture investor. You know, we have a traditional approach to that. We're an equity investor. Um, we look to take minority positions in companies, um, but it is, it is, there is a, that impact filter. So, you know, we are looking to actively quantify in our investment process, how a company's business product or service can affect that outcome. And so I think we've taken quite a specialist and focused lens here. We're not trying to solve, you know, it's a big problem. Plastics is still a huge challenge globally, um, but there are a number of other environmental outcomes and, and another env environmental issues that, you know, relate to this. Um, so we, we've been focusing over the last two and a half years on, on that problem and with spending about 25 million pounds um, on a portfolio currently of about 22 companies. Um, we're, we're investing early at sort of pre-seed through series A um, and um, you know, trying to help build those businesses. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I think is the evolution of this model is, is an alignment piece of saying, yeah, we're not just going to provide that capital in a grant form, um, we, we want to, you know, we want to be a part of the business. We want to get the resources that we have at Sky to help these businesses. Now, we're not you know, some of these businesses that we've invested in are high early stage science based businesses. So we're not necessarily providing that kind of scientific expertise to the companies. We are more of a generalist. Think of us as a supporting you with the business building elements, branding, marketing, go to market. How do you build a consumer narrative? How do you communicate your problem, which I think we felt is a, you know, a valuable thing for early stage startups in sustainability where you're, you know, trying to, you know, uh, expand the virtues of, of, of what you're doing. Um, I think the only other thing to add is we have sought to partner with uh, people where in effect we've, we've lacked that, you know, primary expertise. Um, so we've worked with um, Innovate UK, who I'm sure a lot of people maybe on the call are familiar with, the UK's grant funding agency, on a dedicated match funding partnership. So the companies we've invested to get access to proprietary access to a, a pot of grant funding that we match with equity investment. So, you know, there's a sort of, uh, you know, a benefit there. And then last year we ran a global X prize style innovation challenge with National Geographic, who are another obviously kind of impact led media organization like us. Um, uh, and we were searching for entrepreneurs around the world who had uh, innovative solutions to the plastics challenge. So that's sort of broadly what we're doing um, and, and, and where we fit. And I think, um, you know, on Katie's taxonomy, we're probably closer to the non-strategic angle of this. You know, we, we're not, this is, none of these businesses are going to get hugely integrated into Sky. Um, you know, obviously I mentioned we have a business transformation process which requires us to remove single use. So where appropriate, we've trialed different technologies in our supply chain. Um, but it's more about uh, you know supporting these the growth of these businesses and that impact objective. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. But but uh, happy to dive in if there's more detail needed. Um, one one question I have I know that um, you, you found sort of the impact of Dora platform very helpful to 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 your work. Um, perhaps you could sort of elaborate a little bit on on how you've been uh, how you've been using it. Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's a it's a everyone knows the challenges of uh, well sorry not everyone knows but but if from coming from the investor side origination deal sourcing frankly on the entrepreneurial side you know getting your investment opportunity out to a market is an extremely fragmented and frustrating exercise and um you know that's made even you know it's it's, it's tough in traditional venture capital in any event because frankly at the earliest of stages you are typically you know, the, the availability of capital is, is, is very fragmented and, and people aren't necessarily advertising them. So it's hugely network driven. And, that, and then that provides, you know, systemic challenges to people who maybe don't have that network from day one. Um, you add on the overlay of, of what we call impact. And again, that challenge around what am I trying to achieve? And I think that then provides an extra layer of complex, complexity that, that makes it really difficult to match sources of funding with entrepreneurial ideas. So I think that's kind of, you know, that's what struck me as, as a very simple message with, with Impact Agora and a very, um, you know, clean approach to, to this to try and, you know, get people aligned. And I think 
I've seen a number of people trying to do it or thinking about it a different way to do it. And, and it does need, you know, a systems approach. It needs this kind of ecosystem building around it. Um, and obviously, you know, support from uh, corporates who can, who can build this as a platform so that it provides value. So yeah, no, we've been working on kind of, we're, we're hoping to get some companies that, you know, we've invested early. So we'll, we'll, we'll see some companies maturing that hopefully get onto the platform, but we've also been looking at deals, uh, you know, um, on, on the system. That's fantastic. Um, so uh, I, I guess sort of going back to um, what Katie said earlier, um, the way that Barclays approach this is Barclays has very much at the strategic investment side of uh, the, the, the spectrum. Um, we launched the Sustainable Impact Capital Initiative uh, earlier this year, and it's a uh, global initiative to invest 175 million um, over five years uh, to really finance the transition to a sustainable future, focusing on sort of fast growing, innovative, um, environmental focused uh, companies that are they're essentially advancing the UN SDGs. So from a from a high level perspective, we've sort of aligned ourselves to the environmental focus uh, UN SDGs. And uh, we've then sort of turned those into sort of focus, more specific sort of focus areas um, that we that we we are looking to sort of build upon. So for example, um, energy efficiency, greenhouse gas emissions reduction technology, uh, green transport, sustainable agriculture. Um, and then what 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 we have then sort of moved into, or what we've what we've uh, um, broadened our approach around is is the that sort of strategic investment um, approach that uh, that that the principal investments team have always had. Um, we've always been a strategic investor in the in the fintech sector, um, but now as we apply a sort of a similar lens to sustainability, we've um, I guess identified sort of three core. Uh, key tests that we look to incorporate into our sort of initial screening and, and due diligence as we as we look to build our portfolio. Um, and those sort of three key, three key tests uh, can be sort of summarized as um, strategic, impactful and economic. Um, impactful uh, should be pretty clear. It's, it's all around achieving sort of those meaningful uh, positive environmental returns uh, similarly with with economic in terms of delivering sustainable commercial success um, it's how we define strategic that uh, perhaps sort of slightly differs to the remainder of our portfolio and uh, for us it's about supporting Barclays long-term goal of, of transitioning its businesses customers or, or communities to a more sustainable operating model so it's it's both um, both internal, looking at, at Barclays' own sort of um, carbon footprint, um, but also in external in terms of helping our clients um, to 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 transition. Um, and we, you know, we think this is an incredibly uh, exciting um, uh, expansion of our of our mandate, and and look to be sort of uh, building onto this uh, in in 2021 as as we uh, as we move forward. So um, I'm conscious of of time because we want to uh, receive questions from the audience as well. So I guess um, Katie, perhaps if we can go back to you, um, based on what you're hearing. Um, you know, 2020 has been a bit of a, a basket case of a year. Of a year, but let's let's look ahead to 2021. Um, what more is needed from uh, from from corporates to uh, to to grow this space? Uh, yeah, thanks, James. Yeah, if we could uh, just park 2020, just move on. <laughs> uh, although for some, it's been, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, an opportunity to really kind of figure out how to accelerate and partner really, really well. Um, so to answer your question in terms of wrap ups, I, I, what more from corporate, I think um, a couple of things. One is ju it's just maturity, consolidation. Um, you know, it, it takes time to figure out where the opportunities are. James, to your point about your sort of framework or your criteria, you know, actually what goes in all of those boxes? What, how do you prove those returns on investment across those different axes? And I think that's for the corporate. And I think it's also the same for the entrepreneur, because I think, I personally have seen a number of entrepreneurs who feel sort of let down by their um, 
uh, accelerators that they've joined or their partnering attachments to corporates um, because perhaps they just had a slightly misaligned communication with the company and expectations are a bit out. So I think it's, it's about figuring out how to talk to each other really, really well and really understand what their expectations are and get it mapped out properly and get those frameworks kind of really anchored in. As you mentioned earlier, platforms um, like the Agora are absolutely essential in terms of um, maturing the ecosystem um, so that actually we can enable that kind of deal flow, enable and match match companies and organisations and impact activities together. Um, in terms of is, is this kind of a genuine opportunity or a way that corporates are going, I don't think we'll see corporates go backwards. I've heard, so we've done a kind of listening exercise just in the last couple, of, literally a couple of weeks with some of our, our um, main supporters across business fights poverty and the number of them who I have worked with quite closely actually before it, two three years ago who I would say that they were still a kind of bit of a bolt onto their business who are saying to me now this is we are really doing impact deeply we are doing it strategically it's from the top every every part of the business wants to be part of this they're not seeing this as a bolt on and I think impact venturing is the same it just needs to kind of continue quite frankly to, to mature so um credibility i think we're kind of at the tipping point you know there is money to be made there is impact to be had and um, it's about just sort of quite frankly going on i think in terms of kind of trends for 2021 to to your quite kind of question because of that maturity because of the speed of it i think there's a kind of you know, how do you do this? Can we sort of share best practice? So it's like platforms like this, it's conversations that we're having now. Um, EVPA are launching a tool this next month or something around actually how do you go about um, setting up funds like this and different options, etc. So it's that kind of um, continued um, work. So um, yeah, I think it's it's all forward. The only thing I'd say is like, I wish we could figure out a way to measure social impact a bit better so or measure the st strategy, et cetera, a bit better so that we can really play that back to businesses as to why um, this is worth doing. Just, I think we've just got to, we've got to keep going until we've really nailed down that measurement. And yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's that's going to be a huge challenge. So, um, with that, we'll we'll open to uh, questions now from the audience. But I'd like to um, take the opportunity to to thank the panelists for a hugely informative and uh, enjoyable insight into this topic. So, um, with that, I'll I'll hand back to you, Raras, for um, Q and A. Yeah, thanks, James, and uh, and all of you for for the initial comments. Um, please do use the Q and A box, which is which is open. Uh, and we'll we'll take questions from there. Uh, meanwhile, I'll, I'll I'll use my um, my position to ask James a quick question uh, around uh, around the, the investments that you've done currently, because uh, I know this is something you launched just this year. But uh, I think there's already uh, some investments that you've made. So maybe just to give people a flavor of that and see if it's kind of relevant for where they are in their journey. Sure. I mean, so yes, we 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 launched the initiative um, uh, March this year. So it was uh, as as with everything, timing is everything in the in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but we have made uh, two very um, exciting investments so far that um, we're you know hugely enthusiastic about. Um, the first is in a company called uh, Save Money Cut Carbon, which is a a great uh, UK firm that really helps um, consumers and, and uh, homes and businesses um, reduce their energy and water uh, consumption and in turn reduce their um, carbon footprint. Um, and the second one, which was um, announced um, uh, actually only a, a few weeks ago, uh, is an equity the investment in a company called um, 80 Acres Farms. Uh, it's a very exciting uh, company that is in the vertical farming space um, that is looking to um, reduce the, uh, the, the, the negative impact that uh, our agricultural sort of uh, system has on on the natural environment and and bring bring that more into sort of the urban populations growing sort of locally fresh nutritious food um, in in controlled environments so two very sort of exciting um, investments that have um, uh, started off our, our our portfolio and and will help us move uh, move forward. That's great. Um, I'll uh, go through some of the questions we've gotten so far. 
Um, one of the questions from Clark is about the key parameters for investing and in impact businesses at an early stage. So maybe that one's for you, Jamie, because you've you're quite early stage. Yeah, for sure. I think it it you know um, doesn't necessarily change too much from how a traditional venture capitalist would look at an early stage company. It's uh, a lot about the people and the team who are trying to build this and their sort of proprietary insight into the product or service that they're trying to build. As I said, I think the overlay for us is we're trying to uh, filter for an environmental outcome. So we have to be able to see quite clearly from, from this, even from this early stage of the theory of change around the product or service and, and how we think it can um, affect the problem, be it in our case, a material that might replace plastic or a way to make you know, material recovery more circular. Um, and that, you know, that typically, typically lend, lends itself to us defining a, an outcome or a KPI that we want to track around that, which isn't uniform. It, it's broadly within the, the STG framework, but it will be something specific around the company. So that, that's our process and how, how we think about uh, quantifying uh, the, the impact element, which is probably the, the, the kind of the most important element. So it's important to be able to tell that story as an entrepreneur and, and to be able to articulate that for an impact investor. Great. Um... We, I, I think, uh, early Ashish could comment on that as well, but there's quite a few questions coming in. So let me turn on to this one about the benefits for corporate to enter this space of, of corporate venturing or, or, or corporate impact venturing. And James, maybe just going to you, because I think this is quite a recent initiative for Barclays and you probably know kind of how it started. Um, I, I think your explanation was was great in terms of the, um, expanding the remit of what what is strategic, but in terms of maybe what other benefits accrue to to the bank or to the customers or or even to your team as a result of this activity, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, so I would say um, there are a number of sustainable product teams um, across the bank, and you know we are, but uh, but but one in, 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 in our area. But what I, what I like to think about is, if you like, um, we're the, um, the entry point, uh, so to speak, to the, the Barclays sort of sustainable ecosystem, such that as we take investments, um, as our companies um, uh, grow, um, Barclays can sort of support those, those companies through their sort of evolving uh, strategic needs. So, help them essentially achieve their long-term sort of vision for sustainability. So, you know, as the company grows, it needs debt offerings, it needs a bond issuance, you know, ultimately it needs sort of an IPO. Barclays can be, um, can be the, be there to help them um, help them on that journey and I think that's sort of an in incredibly sort of um, powerful um, uh, powerful offering for, um, for, for for companies yeah that, that makes sense uh, another quick one from Muna about whether investments need to specifically have a social mission or whether they're just avoiding negative impact I think all of the speakers have, have shown that they have some impact thesis and, and this goes beyond beyond ESG. Um, so um, maybe just a last one then from, from Chris uh, from River Simple. They're a hydrogen electric car manufacturer based in Wales uh, and they want to raise capital to get to mass manufacturing in 2023. Um, they'd like to know kind of where can they find patient capital and um, and and kind of how how they fit within the the impact investing spectrum. Any of uh, let's see, uh, maybe Ashish, you want to comment on that in terms of in terms of patient capital? Yeah, um, I think uh, when it comes to patient capital, uh, like uh, the approach to uh, you know providing that has really evolved uh, over the last decade or so, and like we call, call ourselves like providing patient capital and we have demonstrated that with a number of enterprises, we provided 10 years of patient grant capital to enterprise, let them the, all their pivoting and you know, uh, transformation of the company. Uh, you know, it, it was a, a, a mini grid company in India and eventually they attracted like a series B funding, you know, and then we sort of graduated them. So uh, I think uh, 
since our focus primarily is uh, in the markets and you know uh, in Africa and India, so I I think we we t- tend to uh, find enterprises which are focused there. But uh, there are other like I think Jamie mentioned uh, entities like Innovate UK, uh, which is uh, uh, really uh, so we have tr- we have kind of been sort of interacting with them over time, uh, formally and informally. And I think a number of those types of uh, institutions are right and. Uh, for you know, applying for any kind of uh, funding, as well as uh, uh, there will be other foundations and uh, you know even venture entities which can uh, look for uh, to provide uh, any both commercial like uh, you know equity positions or even grants uh, that you know. So I mean, from this market perspective, I can't elaborate, but from emerging market, I can give many examples. Yeah, and and I think um, and I think as you said, with the foundation angle, that leads to even more patience and perhaps uh, yeah. a strategic arm. Um, I will uh, wrap us up there in terms of the uh, the, uh, the the speakers, but I want to give you just a few updates from from Agora uh, for a couple minutes before before the, your next meeting. Um, so first of all, um, we we wanted to share a recent a recent investment that has completed through the platform. It is a business called um, PowerRoll and um, and it's uh, it came through a partner called Acceleris. Um, they have raised a 2.8 million round. It's actually still open for top ups, um, but one of the investors came came through the platform and uh, and that uh, deal is uh, will will definitely close uh, before the end of the year. Um, and uh, actually, on that point, I wanted to say that actually uh, Shell Foundation, Skyrush Ventures, and James's team are all uh, users on Agora. So if um, if you are uh, essentially one of our members, or if you are funded by one of our members, you can uh, get your business listed on on Agora, and then they can review it through there. Um, and and you know, thanks to all of you for kind of being early adopters on on our journey. Um, and just to highlight some of our other transactions and, and, and opportunities, this is a, a list of some of the deal flow that is, um, has come through, through the platform. I'll highlight some that are quite recent. We've had three charity bond opportunities from Chiodos Bank UK. Uh, we have a, um, a, a sustainable consumer business from Sustainable Ventures, um, which is a raising a 1.2 million round. We have a carbon capture business that is raising a 20 million round. It's uh, based here in Europe um, and it's coming from Blue Wave Innovation Capital. We actually also have a vertical farming business, um, a second deal from, from Acceleris and, uh, and, and also a, a ag tech fund from uh, Ireland, which is quite exciting as they've gotten a cornerstone from the European Investment Fund. Uh, and lastly, a water innovations fund that's also come through recently. So I think uh, some exciting opportunities that you guys may want to look at if you are members or if not request to join. Um, here is a reminder of, of our criteria. Um, it is, uh, you know, depends on what uh, type of organization you represent, but, um, you know, we look for, for, for people who can provide uh, several several opportunities per year, or who who have who have a, a kind of a mandate to invest around these impact themes, and uh, actually on that point, you know we've we've already reached uh, over sixty members. Uh, here are some of them, um, but we're also finalizing a, a member directory, which is available through uh, the the portal. Uh, will be available this this week, uh, and then you can you can um, actually read about each of their of their focus areas you know ticket size investment themes etc um lastly wanted to um you know to say also big thanks to to our colleague ash brown who um who's leaving us um in december to pursue a new role in in ireland um and you know, huge thanks for for everything. You know, we wouldn't be here today without your dedication, energy, and, and hard work. And at the same time, we're welcoming back um, Matt Davies from uh, Sicon- and, and, and from from Delio for a secondment to to Agora, and also uh, Stefano Caponari as a fellow. So um, 
huge team effort behind this. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and also thanks to all of the partners for your involvement so far. Um, thank you also for, to the speakers for, uh, for your, your great thoughts today and, uh, and, and the insights. Um, and stay tuned for more updates over email. If uh, you have further questions also, please drop us a line. Thanks everyone for tuning in early today and um, have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Varish. Keep up the good Thank work. You. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.